All right, how's everyone doing? You have a good lunch? Yeah? So everybody's ready to fall asleep now, right? <laughs> After lunch? This talk is perfect for you then. You can digest while you, uh, you can digest your lunch now. So the most important thing for me is that you follow me on Twitter. I'm very vain. I like uh, conferences for me are a way to get more followers. So, and as an incentive for you, if you follow me on Twitter, I will post my notes right now. So if you follow me on Twitter, you can get access to the notes now and follow along. This is me. I'm Flembo's dad. Who's Flembo, you might ask? Um, how many people use Slack here? OK, yeah. So in Slack, you know that we have emoji. You know that, um, so we can take something like this. And here's another plug. So we have a Rat Pack Slack. That's Flembo. So uh, it's, it's a nice, it, that's my offspring. You can, the resemblance is pretty uncanny, isn't it? But um, yeah, this is a little proud moment that I want to share. Slack liked it, so they wanted to print sweatshirts, and they print it out and have it at their cubicles and their desk. So that's me. That's who I am. Um, I'm a tech lead. I'm based out of New York. and. Just a little bit about, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping first, and then we'll get right into this presentation. So uh, the code is available, and you can take a look at everything here. I'm, I just want to go through the project setup very quickly. So if you take a look at our project, it looks like um, we're using ASCII Doctor to put together the documentation. And from the documentation, it looks something like this on the right side. And you can see here what we're doing is we're in. If you've never used ASCII Doctor before to do documentation, I highly recommend it. Um, one of the problems with documentation is that oftentimes documentation lies to you because the code within it rots over time. ASCII Doctor allows you to include code snippets from actual code. And so if you include your code snippets from your tests and your tests pass as a part of your build, then your documentation is therefore tested. Uh, that's how we set this up. So as you can see, we have a promise specification. These are where all the examples will be. And just to prove to you that they all work, I'm just going to run this entire specification once. And then, uh, and then that will be that. So we have a lot of examples here. They're going, they're passing. <coughs> Spoiler alert, some of the output there. Here's throttling in action. OK, any questions? <laughs> All right, no questions. Good, then my job here is done. <laughs> Twitter handle, L Spacewalker. That's how you, that's how you uh, spell Danny in uh, American English. OK, so now that the code's out of the way, um, another plug here is that there is a book about Rat Pack written by one of our core colleagues on the Rat Pack team, Dan Woods. He's currently working at Target, where their default um, web framework of choice for rolling out microservices is indeed Rat Pack. And uh, this book is available. It's pretty comprehensive. I recommend getting it. Another item here, this is the website. From here, you can access things like the documentation, the JDK, um, the Java docs. The, there's also a link to join our Slack. So the Slack link is available here. It's available from the page, but you can get it through there. You can come and join and say hello in the Slack channel. Thanks. <laughs> OK, so cool. All right, now that that's out of the way, let's talk about Asynchronous, non-blocking, blah, 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 reactive, all these buzzwords that everyone's using these days. Here is a quick summary of what we need to get through. There's a lot of stuff, so I'm going to go through it. That's why I made the notes available, so you can follow at your own pace. If something's unclear, you can go at it. And if you still have a question, then you can feel free to bring it up while we're going through the presentation. Again, here are just some, uh, my notes are also available in PDF, so format. So if you'd like to download this onto your mobile device or something like that, you can 
You can do that for your return trip, so you can look at it if you don't have uh, access to data, like I won't on a plane, for example. All right, so let's talk about the need for asynchronous code. Um, the idea is that you, you know, in this day of cloud computing, you pay uh, each of your usages metered, right? So how much memory you're using, how much uh, compute you're using, and how much I.O. you're using, right? So everything's metered and you pay for what you consume. Well, it turns out that um, kind of the de facto, the standards that we have in the industry today are pretty expensive. They, they kind of compromise um, resource usage for usability of the framework, right? If we take a look at how we serve web requests today, you can see that you, know, you, ha you have your um, typical old school static uh, web frameworks like Apache that spawns multiple processes to handle a certain number of requests, right? And this is probably the most prohibitive um, cost. As your, as your load increases onto your server, uh, Apache starts forking processes, and well, that's, that's very expensive. <coughs> we, what we have in the Java world, we typically deploy to a servlet container, which has a thread pool model, where for each connection, you have a dedicated thread. So really, you're not able to accept any more connections if your thread pool is maximized. Um, this is less expensive than using processes, but it still gets to be pretty expensive, and you run into limitations pretty quickly. Um, threads are expensive. They take compute and memory. So when you take a look at, well, what are other people doing? Netty is out there. It's been available for a while. They are an invented um, generic network programming asynchronous and non-blocking library. It abstracts the transport and the details of how we send and receive H, um, networking packets. And it abstracts that out so that we can talk about things in terms of channels and promises and things like that. Um, that tends to use event loops, which is just a thread that pulls through any kind of I.O. events and will handle them as they come in. Uh, for more information about you know, what's available out there, we can take a look at this resource that I've made, that I've linked here. So this talks about C10K, which is talking about how can a single node process 10,000 concurrent connections simultaneously. Um, it's a good read. It has pretty good information about where we've been, what are the different um, techniques that people have used, and yeah, it's a good write-up. So. Okay, so async, we're talking about resource consumption. Well, that correlates directly to scalability. So here we have um, DHH, the creator of Rails. He talks about scalability. So Bandcamp, which is a Rails-based application, he's saying reaches about 2,000 peak requests per second across, mm, it's not across instance, it's across all instances. And that's about 30 app servers. I think they don't run, I think they run their own hardware but I'm not sure. There's a, um, there's a quote there. So, I mean, if you imagine 30 application servers handling 2,000 requests per second at your peak traffic, um, it seems like a pretty expensive way to be handling 2,000 requests per second. In contrast, if you look at the other end of kind of scalability, we have, we see here from um, Norman Maurer, who is, I believe now, the lead project um, maintainer for the Netty project. <coughs> he works at Apple. You can see here, um, there's something like 400,000 plus, so that's like 10 to the 5 um, instances of whatever's running out there, and they're all running Netty. And you can see here, they're processing like tens of petabytes. That's quite a bit of data. And if you talk about requests per second, tens of millions, so 10 to the 7th, right? So if you compare 10 to the 7th with 10 to the 5th uh, nodes against, what do we have here? 10 to the 3 for 10 to the 1, right? At any rate, what the takeaway here, you can't really get much of a takeaway here except for the fact that it's expensive. And what you would like to do is try to minimize your resource consumption so that you can lower your footprint, so that you can lower your bill at the end of the day. This is a way to save your company money. Now, the problem with this is that um, oftentimes, uh, the way to reduce resource usage is to go async. Um, Currently, if you use blocking socket technology, you're, wait, you're blocking your CPU. So the CPU cannot do anything until the return, uh, until you get the interrupt back from whatever I.O. operation that you made. And 
There are graphs out there that demonstrate this. I haven't included it here, but it's, there's quite a bit of uh, sleeping that goes on in the CPU. So your CPU could be doing something else, but instead it's just waiting there, not letting anything else happen until your I.O. comes back. So <clears throat> that's why we have asynchronous. Asynchronous is difficult. Netty is a difficult library to use. Um, if you look at your colleagues, right, we have, I mean, at one, at one extreme we have Netty, at the other extreme we have Rails, so a very highly opinionated full stack application um, framework versus Netty, which is just a general purpose evented network programming API. So th what we're looking for is to strike the balance between scalability, which is really about decreasing your use, uh, resource consumption, to the usability of the frameworks that you're working with. So, I mean, sometimes you'll hear like, oh yeah, you know, but uh, your bottleneck in your application is gonna be database calls anyways. But, you know, people have introduced other mechanisms to help get around that, right? Like we have caching, we have um, static assets and memory content. So even if your application is a CRUD application, as an example, a CRUD app, an admin CRUD application, it is possible that not every single call is going to be a DB call. And even in that case, you don't want to be letting nothing else happen while all you're doing is doing a, a JDBC lookup as an example. So let's take a look at the state of asynchronous programming in Java. So from almost the very beginning we've had threads. Uh, later on we've introduced executors and thread pools and we have mutexes and atomic references. So we have the primitives to allow for concurrent programming. However, testing remains very difficult in this kind of way. Readability, it's hard to follow. Um, also, resource sharing, right? This is, this is a pretty big one. So when you have multiple threads going, when you have multiple mm, fork processes running, and trying to coordinate on shared resources, this becomes a game of trying to figure out your mutexes, your locking, right? And I can tell you right now, we're suffering from this uh, where I work, and we're going through and trying to map our concurrency model so that we can figure out where the bottlenecks are and try to streamline everything. But yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> this is the state of async in, jo um, in Java land. So async is difficult. Why? Because it's non-deterministic. There's many ways it can fail. You can fire and something, and maybe you'll never get back a response, as an example. There's also callback hell. So if mm -hmm. everything becomes asynchronous, and you're trying to compose the behavior, then if you have an error happening somewhere deep within your call graph, how do you handle that when you have other asynchronous activity going on on the sides, right? And that's when that error happens, how do you handle it? And how do you propagate the fact that that error did happen? So asynchronous is difficult. There's a reason why servlet model has reigned king for so long and that people have been fine to just scale out horizontally. <coughs> As an example, right? If you're, if you're using Node.js or if you've used Play Framework, it's um, whenever you make a promise, it starts executing immediately. And if you don't ever respond to that promise, if you don't register a callback, it's possible that you may never even send a response to the client who made the request to your application in the first place, right? So brain damage is what I like to call this in trying to track down what's happening in your application. Um, asynchronous behavior has this way of twisting your brain around and reducing you to uh, your brain to a pile of mush that you cannot really use anymore. So we have libraries that come to the rescue, of course. Um, Different people have different opinions on how asynchronous behavior should happen. So if we're starting with you know, some primitives, we have futures, we have callbacks. As of Java 8, we have a completable future. Uh, people have decided, you know what, let's put things in atomic tasks and create queues, blocking queues that we can pull from. Um, let's try doing fork join if that kind of paradigm is applicable to your uh, concurrency model. Then you have actors. You have Disruptor, right? Disruptor is a pretty cool um, white paper as well as a library. Um, and you have continuations in the JVM um, from the parallel universe, in particular the Quasar library. So there are different ways of doing things. And of course, who can, we're at GreyConf, we, can, we should also mention gParse. So gParse, um, if you haven't used it, it's a very nice way of kind of describing how things should flow without you having to set all that up manually. And that's kind of the direction that we're going into. So the idea is to try to eliminate um, coordination on resource contention, right? There's, and here's why. Like if you take a look at Alexis Shipolev's blogging posts, um, you can read about Java memory model pragmatics. 
very good talk. It's very intense and very deep and very dry, but it's, these are really good um, blog posts that you should read at some point. So he also has his notes available for a mobile and I think PDF as well, but I highly recommend going through here. Once you go through that, you'll realize why you want to kind of avoid trying to share resources between running threads. <coughs> so here comes Ratpack, right? Ratpack is asynchronous, non-blocking, blah, 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 reactive, whatever. You know what, though? Like, asynchronous and non-blocking frameworks, they're coming out, like, they're nothing special anymore. It's kind of the norm now. Or maybe the, maybe not the bleeding edge anymore, but maybe towards early adoption. So why should you use Ratpack? Well, Ratpack provides its own concurrency model, which we call the execution model. And this execution model is basically everything that you need to know about how Ratpack handles asynchronous and non-blocking. So the execution model is really the value that adds to Ratpack, and this is, this is what sold me on Ratpack personally. So let's take a look at the Ratpack threading model. Essentially, it's built on top of Netty, so it adopts the Netty threading model. Right? So you have an ent entry point to executing your chain. Your chain is just, um, you can think of it as a pipeline of request handlers. It handles uh, NIO events, like if you're calling channel.read, channel.write, that all happens through abstractions from Ratpack through request and response objects. Uh, it also takes care of scheduling and coordinating executions on your behalf. Now, um, here's, here's a very stern warning that I have here. Never block the compute thread. So unless, it's, unless you're explicitly stating otherwise, you're most likely on the compute thread. And we'll go into what does that even mean. So and uh, there's the compute thread, which is also the same event loop that is from Netty. And for any kind of blocking code that you need to run, we do have a dedicated thread pool for executing your blocking code. So any kind of long running blocking IO, as an example, JDBC, or old school Java file reads, you should take care to execute this in the blocking executor. Now, what is, an, no, what is a Ratpack execution exactly? So this kind of sounds like BS a little bit, but essentially an execution is a series of execution segments that are in a pipeline, right? So you can, you can essentially think of it as a queue. And every time you create a promise or any kind of asynchronous work, what you're really doing is you're queuing an execution segment to be run in the future. So promises, operations, and blocking, like these are all primitives that Ratpack provides for you to be able to queue execution segments. And another thing to note is that execution segments are always executed on the same thread. So, and the other thing that you should note here is that a given execution segment has exclusive access to the event loop. That means that you don't have to worry about um, resource sharing there. So there's more in-depth um, blog posts from Luke Daly, who is the project lead and uh, by far the biggest contributor to the Ratpack project. Um, he has really good uh, blog articles here talking about execution model and what guarantees that we have here. OK, so we talked about promises, operations, and blocking. So a promise is essentially a unit of code that will run sometime in the future and should produce some kind of value. Operation, you can think of as a promise, except it's a type void. So you're not going to receive anything, and you're not going to get anything. It just represents a bit of code that's going to run that you don't care about what happens to it in the end. Uh, and then we also have blocking. So this allows you to schedule on the blocking executor. So all of your JDBC code, um, all of your old file I.O., maybe if you're using Apache Commons, I think, uses all the old school file I.O. So anything like that, you should be putting in blocking. So you should know that each of these primitives are really just syntactic sugar around working with the execution API. So the execution API is really the base level that you have in Ratpack. The execution is what allows you to queue things up, execute them, and coordinate. Um, so if you can't find a kind of behavior that you'd like to have in promise operation and blocking, you can always build it yourself. I should note here that this is meant to be kind of a joke. I think the only person who can do this right now is Luke. And even he will report back and say, man, my brain hurts right now. But um, yeah. So let's talk about promises and, op and operations. So creating a promise schedules an execution segment. We talked about that. 
uh, promises are executed in the order that they were created. So when you create promises, you're queuing execution segments, right? They will execute in that exact order that you've declared them. Um, with the exception for forked promises, but we will get to that later. So promises, they either run on the compute thread or on the blocking thread. And this is determined at the time of creation. So depending on how you're creating a promise, that's already telling you, that's indicative of where this bit of execution is going to run, whether that's on the compute thread or on the blocking thread. Um, and really, this is, this is the key takeaway here, is that when you're working in asynchronous libraries, you often have to adapt your blocking code to work with the new framework. Rat Pack makes it easy to do that by providing these um, primitives that we have here, like promises, operations, and blocking. So let's say you're using an asynchronous library that has its own thread pool, that does its own thing. We have adapters that allow you to adapt that into Rat Pack. So you can, if you have like a completable future-based library, you, that's pretty easy to adapt to Rat Pack. And we'll go over that kind of stuff. So testability. Rat Pack provides exec harness, which is a testing fixture that makes it easy to um, test your Rat Pack asynchronous code. And it allows you to run this without starting a Rat Pack server. So exec harness will take care of setting up your compute thread, event loops. It'll take care of uh, creating your blocking. And so it gives it a context for your test to run in. Um, I should also note, though, that starting a Rat Pack server is a very, very low cost in terms of overhead. So in the Rat Pack code base itself, a lot of our unit tests are actually standing up and tearing down full Rat Pack servers, and the tests don't take very long to run. A couple of notes about exec harness. It is auto-closable, which means that if you're using, well, you have to be on Java 8, but uh, in Groovy, at least, if you're using the new Parrot project, which is, um, which is an effort to uh, gap the bridge between Java and Groovy syntax, you can use a try with resources. So that's pretty nice. Um, exec harness also has convenience uh, methods that you just pass the bit of code that you would like to run, and it'll take care of starting it up and bringing it down for you. But it is auto-closable, so if you're starting it and you're not auto-closing it, make sure that you close it at the end of your tests. So let's talk about exec harness a little bit. Um, I just want to go back into the code for a second. So if you take a look here, we do have an exec harness in our specification. This is how we get an instance of it. Um, Spock has this really nice auto cleanup. So by the end of your specification, Spock will take care of cleaning it up automatically for you. So you don't have to worry about doing that. And we also have this nice delegate um, annotation, which allows us to delegate calls like this run. This looks like magic. If you were to see this, you'd be like, oh, where the hell is run coming from? We're delegating this call against the exact harness that we've declared as a delegate here. So that's a bit of a groovy niceness that we have available to us. So exec harness allows you to run your rat pack promises and operations. Essentially, it allows you to run your executions. So yield is one way to do this. If you have an, if you have an instance of your exec harness, you can uh, simply provide your promise here. And what yield does is it consumes the promise. And you can access the value of that promise and make your assertions in here. The other thing about exec harness is that it will execute your promise in a blocking manner in the testing thread so that by the time you have your value, you can just simply make your assertion like that, which is pretty handy. And remember, if you're not cleaning it up yourself, make sure that you close your uh, exec harness when you're done. Um, so there is an alternative version called yield single. So instead of grabbing an instance and cleaning it up, um, you can essentially call uh, yield single, and this is a static method. You provide your promise and you still get your result back. The only difference here is that you don't need to grab an instance and shut it down yourself. Um, you'll see that in exec harness, we have method name and then method name single versions. So the single versions always take care of starting up and shutting down for you. Now, if you have a series of tests running, I recommend that you grab an instance and close it later. Just because uh, yield single means that you're tearing it up and down every single time, and there's probably a bit of overhead there. I don't, it's, it might be negligible, I'm not sure, but I always just tend to use something like this in that kind of situation. Okay, and then we have run. So unlike yield, the run variety does not actually consume your promise. So that means that you have to consume your promise yourself. So we'll get into a little bit about what that means. 
But essentially here, um, run is a void return type, so there's nothing to grab out of run, so all your assertions need to be inside here. And if you take a look, if you're used to you working with Spock, you're just used to putting your expressions in the expect block, but since we're running inside of a closure, you need to run your assertions here so that if your assertion fails, Spock can report on it. So that's why you need to put your assert key word in here. So that's just a note. And again, we have run single, which works like yield single. <clears throat> okay, so there's some advanced asynchronous concepts that promised we won't be covering, but serial batch and parallel batch we will be covering. And this is the latest addition to kind of enhancing uh, asynchronous behavior for um, syntactic sugar. Okay, now we get to the fun part, all the examples, right? So the rest of the talk, we're going to be going through these examples and kind of demonstrating what goes on and explaining how Rat Pack asynchronous uh, works here. So here's a factory. We have a static method called sync from, Rat Pack, uh, from Promise. The deprecated method is called of. This used to be the original method, but now what we're doing is we're providing a closure here. In general, when you're looking at libraries and you see that you're passing either a closure or an interface or a lambda or something like that, you should be weary of when that code gets executed. So we talk about imperative coding here, right? And um, this, is not so, this is not so imperative. This is more declarative. You're telling it what you want to do when some kind of condition is met here. So another thing to note here is that because this is a lambda, promises are lazy. So promises do not, they get queued up, but they don't execute until you tell them to execute. So again, this is a huge departure from libraries like uh, from frameworks like Node or Play Framework or even Java, where you create a new, a new feature, a new task, and it just starts executing immediately. That's not the case in Rat Pack. Promises get queued, and until you, until you subscribe to them, nothing happens. So as an example here, just because we create the promise, we can see that we actually don't set not executed to false. So we assert that the promise was not executed. And this is not a matter of timing. This is not a matter of... Um, race conditions, this is just a matter of promises being lazy. So this is something that you need to know. So how do you execute a promise then? So when you create a promise chain, what ends up happening is uh, if you'd like to then figure out the result of this processing, you invoke then. Then is a return type of void. Um, and calling then invokes the execution of the promise pipeline there. So you can see here, we can actually get an assertion here that S is equal to sync. But wait a second. In this Spock test, we can see that we're going to get an unmanaged thread exception. So this is one of the things that um, people new to Rat Pack run into. They say, well, what's going on here? I'm just trying to consume a promise. What you need to do is you need to run the promise on a Rat Pack managed thread, and that's what exec harness provides to us. So again, this yield method is coming from delegate, from calling the delegate on the exec harness. So we get the value from here, and we, uh, we definitely uh, see that sync is the value that gets returned from the promise here. Okay, so yeah, yeah. just make sure, here's the run variety. So you can, when you're running run, you just need to make sure that you're invoking then so that you can actually make your assertions there. So let's talk about different ways that you can create promises or different ways of producing um, the start of your promise chain. So here's another way of calling value. If you notice here, this is actually a value. This is not a closure, it's not a lambda, it's not an interface. So essentially, this value is readily available, right? So it's not going to queue an execution segment, it's going to queue it and make it available immediately. So when you invoke this, you can see that the value is value. So that's the difference between value and sync. Sync is lazy, value is now. You do it now. Okay, and so let's talk about other ways to create promises. If you're interfacing with JDBC as an example, if you're using a uh, Juke or Groovy SQL or Gorm, anything like that. You need to make sure that you're running it on a blocking thread. And the way to do that is to use this blocking mechanism. So we have a factory here called get. And again, we pass a closure, which should be a signal to you that this is going to be lazily run. It's running sometime in the future. And we can see here that, let's pretend that this is some database call. And this is the result that we get back. So you can see that when we run this execution, we get these we get this return value back from that promise. So um, just to show that blocking threads run on the different threads from compute threads, what we have here is uh, we essentially just have a helper closure here that allows us to grab the current thread name. So Rat Pack uh, names its thread in a, in a very specific kind of way that allows us to tell whether it's blocking or compute. So the first promise here, we can see that we're going to sleep in a blocking thread. 
which will not, which will not block the compute thread. And then what we're going to do is map. So mapping always takes place on a compute thread, as an example. So when we get the current thread name from the blocking thread, and then we map it to the current thread, and we join this result, you can see that we are from blocking and we want to compute, right? So here's yet another way to create a promise, is using promise.async. So here you can, you can pretend that this is some kind of uh, third-party API that is asynchronous and has its own thing going on here. Essentially, we just pass a, a callback to this thing, as is the style of working with uh, promises and, or features from other libraries. And the way to do this is uh, using the async method. So when you use this async method, you're provided a downstream, and the downstream represents downstream from this promise. So when you get, um, so basically we pass downstream.success to the callback, and it will send whatever that value was, which is here, async computation complete, as the value from that promise, and then we're back into rat pack land, and you can keep working with that value there. So just to recap, we've covered sync, we've covered value, we've covered blocking, and we've covered async. These are your basic ways of creating promises and working with them. So operation, we'll just quickly glance over. Operations are, again, of promise type void, and it doesn't receive anything, and it doesn't return anything, right? So if you think about this as a fire and forget logging call, or a fire and forget database upsert, or something like that, you could put that kind of thing in an operation as an example. Um, you can go from promises to operations, and operations to promises. They are, you can use them together. Um, and we have ways to do that. So operations have a promise method, which returns a promise type void. And then you can work with this. So we have methods available on the promise that allow you to either transform values or unpack promises that are returned or um, coordinate kind of forking out and doing parallel processing. And we'll get to those examples here. But here what we did was we created an operation. We then turned it into a promise, if that's what you need to do. Then from the promise, you can see that the value that's received here is null. Right, this, this is in line with what an operation is. Um, and then you can see here, we actually convert this back into a promise, and this promise value then goes back into the then downstream, and we can see that we transform the operation. Okay, and you can go the other way as well. You can start from a promise and go to an operation. So you can see here that um, by calling operation on a promise, we actually still get the value from the previous, which in here would be foo but you don't return anything here. So in the then block, you can see that the implicit argument that comes back is null because it's an operation. Okay, so let's take a look at the anatomy of a promise. So what does it look like from Rapac's perspective when you're creating promises and executing them? So if you take a look at this code, we're creating a promise, hello. What we're doing is we're then transforming this value, hello, we're going to map it to uppercase. And then when that's done, we'd like to send this back to the client. Right? So if we take a look at sync, map, and then, what this does, um, I'm sorry for my poor visuals, I, I realize this might be a little bit difficult to understand, but what I have here, if you take a look at the square brackets, this represents our execution, okay? And each entry, each execution segment that is a part of this execution is comma separated. So that's kind of the notation that I have here. So you can see here in our current executing um, segment, we have this, promise that we execute here. So as we execute this execution segment, uh, Ratpack sees that you called sync, so it queues up one execution segment. It then sees that you call map, so then it adds another execution segment, and then it calls then, which also simultaneously tells Ratpack to start executing the promise chain, and the then execution segment gets set up right there. So from Ratpack's perspective, every time you call these methods, you're queuing up execution segments. And then Ratpack will then take care of processing each segment serially. So even if you're executing asynchronous code, it's going to wait until you return that value before processing to the next segment in the chain. And this is what trips people up a lot when they come to Ratpack. And you would say, wait a second, why would you want this? The whole point of using an application framework that's asynchronous and non-blocking is to fire everything like, and try to maximize everything running in parallel. Right, but that's not what the value proposition of Ratpack is. You can do that, but the default behavior is to queue up execution segments. And it might seem odd to you at first, but in, at, uh, once you get used to it, you start to realize this is a lifesaver because this makes your asynchronous code deterministic, which is a weird way to put it because asynchronous code is actually not deterministic. 
but the handling of it is deterministic. So that's what you get from Ratpack. Another consequence of this is that because you're able to queue up execution segments, Ratpack understands that if you've executed all your execution segments and there's no more queued segments, Ratpack can terminate the connection to the client immediately and tell it that you have a 500 error from the server. No other framework that I know has this capability to detect that there's no more processing to be done in the framework, right? So if you take a look at Node.js, you make an asynchronous call to a library or to some uh, you know, microservice somewhere, and if that promise never comes back, the client that's calling you is also never going to be notified unless you have connection timeout or read timeout or write timeout, something like that set up. But in Ratpack, because we queue up execution segments, if you don't have any by the end of your processing, you know that there's nothing further to do. So Ratpack can detect that and cut the and cut the um, and terminate the connection to the client. So I bring this up because I was bitten by this. We have a couple of known microservices, and sometimes they don't do error handling. So if an error occurs while processing and they don't have an error handler, then we don't send anything back to the user. Uh, and then you might just get like a 503 or something like that, like a timeout connection, right, from the proxy if you have your node service behind a proxy. So again, we queue up execution segments, and with promises, you have values. So Ratpack will take this value, hello, it'll pass it in as the argument to the next execu execution segment. And this is how we progress through the promise chain. Now, how about a little more of an advanced scenario? So what if you needed to, what if you were calling a service that you had that returns a promise? Well, if, you were, if this were a promise value, then Ratpack would simply take that promise value and pass it into the next execution segment. So by the time you get here, you would actually be working with the promise, and that may not be what you want to do. So what we provide is a mechanism called FlatMap. What FlatMap does is it takes your promise, it runs, it runs that code, and then it will queue up that execution segment to be run immediately afterwards. So this is what it looks like. I, there's a little bit of wrapping going on here, which is unfortunate, but if you take a look at the source, hmm. Yeah, so if you take a look here, this might be easier to see. Okay, so what we have going on here is pretty much the same thing. So calling sync uh, queues up one segment, flat map queues up another segment, which you can see this segment is lazy. Um, the promise not, dot sync won't be executed until we call then. And then, uh, and then we have our then segment here. So this is what wrap pack will queue up when you invoke this. And then as it starts executing it, it understands that this is a flat map, so it'll take this promise.sync and queue it up as the next execution segment to be executed. So at the end of the day, it just gets inlined with the promise execution that you have currently. So that's what we're representing here. So hopefully this gives you an idea of how um, promises work in Ratpack, um, how they work with the underlying execution and the execution segments. Okay. Now that we have the bases covered, um, we're just gonna fly through the rest. So, okay, so let's talk about error handling, right? Let's say that for some reason you have a promise where you throw an exception, or you're, you know, you're maybe just wrapping some kind of uh, other external library and it just has runtime exceptions everywhere. Well, what, first of all, what you can do from your rat, uh, from the exec harness is you can get value or throw and then you can check to see that the exception was thrown. So you can do error detection in your testing, which is really nice. But what if you want to handle this error? What if you want to do something about when this error happens? We have a method called onError. OnError receives the throwable, and you can do something with it. Now, the thing here is that onError is a terminal execution segment. What this means is that if this execution gets um, executed, the rest of the promise chain no longer executes. Right? So we can see here that um, from this promise, if, if, we, if no error happens here, we expect to get this map value at the end. But you can see here that the value is indeed not map. We don't have this value map from here. In fact, the value is null. And what we see is that the exception was not thrown from the, pro from the uh, perspective of the execution segment. Um, instead, the processing just stops here. Now, what if, you, what if that's okay? What if, as an example, 
you're trying to populate um, like a catalog or something, and you, you don't care if not every product or every uh, entry in that catalog is available. You just want to show what you can get at the moment. Then we have map error. So map error, you can provide some kind of default value um, or something like that, but the idea is that when the exception uh, gets handled, you can, um, you can continue working with it as long as you provide map error. So here you can see that not only is the exception not thrown because we took care of it by using map error, but we can see that the value that we get back is default value. Now here's another hint um, that people, uh, that newcomers to Rat Pack often trip up on. It's that promises are immutable, right? So if you take a look at an example like this, if we take promise.sync, assign it to a handle P, and if we then say, okay, then we'd like to do P on error, P.map, this will not alter this will queue up um, more execution segments, but it will not alter the previous one. So the behavior that you would expect does not happen. Each of these new methods, each of these methods always returns a new promise. So what you can see here is that when you execute this, we expect um, exception to be set and to be handled. But instead, what we see here is that from the perspective of Rat Pack, you did not handle this exception. So Spock will see that you threw an exception not only that, this exception handler was never called, so exception is still false. Remember, each of the methods that you invoke always returns a new promise. So, I mean, this promise API kind of has a fluent style chain that you can just keep appending these things together so that you can compose these promises, and this would be the way to fix it as an example. Or what you could do um, is keep reassigning P to the new value here as you do that, but that looks ugly. And we don't want to write ugly stuff, right? Hopefully. Uh, okay, so let's talk about mapping and flat mapping. So for those of you who have not worked with Java 8 streams or Rx Java, what mapping does is it takes one value and transforms it to another value. It's as simple as that. Um, so as an example, we start with a value three, then we transform it into a string, and we can see that AAA is what we get back from this mapping here. Flat mapping, as we explained before, expects you to return a promise so that that promise can be inlined with the rest of the execution. So from here, we can simulate some kind of blocking call here, and we can see that we still get AAA back from here. If we did not flat map, in this then, we would expect to get a promise, which might be what you want to do sometimes, but that's more of an advanced use case. So for now, until you get to that point, I don't... Um, I recommend that you just flat map your promises out and get them over with. Okay, so, and I just want to reiterate that each of these tests have passed. You've all witnessed it in the beginning, right? So I'm not going to run the tests for all these. Um, yeah, so if you, if you find that you're doing this a lot, flat map to blocking, we do have a shortcut called blocking map. So you just provide your thing here, and this is just syntactic sugar. Rat Pack takes care of running it on the blocking and then re, uh, flat mapping it back into the current execution. Okay. So, um, yeah, here's just a variant with uh, async. Right, this just shows that if you put your thread.sleep in a new thread and you adapt it to async.promise.async, um, it's not going to block the execution thread. Um, because it's running in a different thread. And once it comes back, it'll continue with the execution of the, um, the execution segments, or the promises. Okay, um, now we're going to some fun stuff. Uh, we can see that we have promise left and right. These are just different ways to work with promises. What I do want to show is, let's say you do have a scenario where you do want your code to, where you do want your promises to run in parallel. We provide mechanisms for that. The two mechanisms that we have are serial batch and uh, parallel batch. Serial batch will, it essentially takes a list of promises and turns it into a list of all the resolved values. So that's what this takes care of. So this example will run through and um, you can see that uh, if we have some kind of price lookup, um, we can take all this groovy range as an example and create a list of promises and we can batch. So a batch here is either a serial or a parallel batch and we pass it the list of promises, and when we call yield, yield will produce, it will produce a list of all the resolved values. So this is one way that you can do that. If you use parallel batch, 
it will run them all together. If you use serial batch, it runs them serially. So that's the difference between the two. Um, let's say you create a promise and you want it to execute immediately, but still be able to use it within the promise chain. That's what fork is for. So you can see here that we have some kind of uh, asynchronous promise that we're adapting to some third-party API. When you call fork, fork returns a new, API, uh, a new promise that starts executing immediately. So if you invoke fork, fork allows you to get your parallel behavior that you might want. Okay, um, we have some more uh, flow control kind of stuff here. We have MapIf. Um, if you go to a job interview and they ask you to implement FizzBuzz, you can do it in Ratpack and get puzzled looks to why you would use a web framework to do FizzBuzz as an example. But here we have it. So for a given candidate, right, you can do FizzBuzz. Um, and the example here is that we can do it in parallel. So when you execute this, you can see that the list still comes back ordered. So it comes back in the way that we've done it, but each execution happened in parallel. Um, we have some other routing stuff here. I just want to go to throttled. So if, as an example, let's say you're consuming some kind of API that has uh, a rate limit, you can use throttle to make sure that no more than n number of promises are executing concurrently. So this, this is how you do it. You create a throttle of size n. Uh, this acts as a semaphore, essentially. So at the end of creating your promise, you invoke the throttled method and pass this throttle, throttle to it. And this will make sure that Ratpack only runs um, n number of promises concurrently. So it's the same FizzBuzz example as before in parallel, but what you can see here is the timing. So you can see that these three are tightly grouped together. The next three are at 367 and then 371, et cetera, et cetera. So you do have ways to kind of control how things flow. Um, and for the most part, I believe our APIs cover the kind of use cases that you would encounter regularly. If you need something that kind of uh, is not available, you can always implement it, or you could ask to have it implemented for you, since um, working with the execution API is a bit difficult, and even the experts in working with it uh, have a difficult time with working with it. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much my, um, my notes that I have available. So for some best practices, um, so when you're starting out with Ratpack, you might find yourself, if you didn't know about flat map, you might find yourself using map and then using promise then and tying it to an async. So you might end up with a promise call that has promise.then, promise.then, promise.then kind of nested together. The idea is to try to linearize that. We provide APIs that allow you to lift that back up into the main execution segment so that it's easier to read. Um, and that's the idea. Try to avoid using multiple then blocks in the same execution flow and try to linearize or flatten your data flow. Um, it's easier on your brain and you'll thank yourself three months down the road when you're trying to revisit the same amount of code or the same code. Okay, so that's what I have for you. I think we're nearly out of time, but if we have questions, I can take them now. I can take them on Twitter, on, on the Slack channel, and in person here at the conference. So any questions? Yeah, it's a lot to take in. Yeah, sure. So the question is, can you use Ratpack promises outside of the library? This is something that we're talking about for Ratpack 2.0. I believe the work for it has already begun to separate the execution stuff out of the code. But yeah, once you start working with Ratpack promises, you're like, I wish this was everywhere. Um, if you want, you can use the exec harness and work with it like this. Um, but again, you're pulling in a whole web framework just to do that. So ideally, we would have a separate library available for you that encapsulates all of this. Um, that is being worked on. Uh, you can't do it today. If you need to, and you don't mind pulling in all this extra binary just to do this, then you can use the exact harness. Yes? Um, I'm trying to think if we have a logger method on our promise. I don't think so. I think I'm thinking of uh, Netty. But what we do have available is this wiretap method. So if for some reason you need to spy on the result of your promises as they flow through, you have this result. It's kind of just an outside observer, and you can, as an example, print out what happened from that promise. We, I don't know if we have anything available that you can just plug in a logger and it'll take care of logging everything out for you.
Yes. Yeah, yeah, there's, there might be concerns with that. Another concern I can think of that's more basic is if you're not using an async appender, as an example, like um, SLF4J or log4j2 has the async appender with disruptor as an example. So you won't get tied up there, but if you're using like an old style blocking logging call, then yeah, that will impact the performance of your promises for sure. So you need to make sure that if you're logging, you're not blocking that. Um, you're not blocking, you're not making a blocking call from within the promise, unless you're in a, a blocking call. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, so the question is if there's any kind of um, APIs that allow you to do file processing with uh, async I.O. The answer is yes. So if, as an example, you're serving static assets. Um, yeah, there is a, there's a mechanism available on the chain that allows you to declare where your assets live, and then Rat Pack will take care of doing that. So if you're not chunking, and if you're not using SSL, we'll use file regions, which is Netty's way of doing zero copy. So instead of having to bring in the data from memory to the socket, it'll just happen in kernel space. So you can, you can avoid the cost of copying um, into user space. So that's nice. Um, we, we do take advantage of that. But again, if you're chunking or if you're using SSL, that's not going to work. So we will still stream it in an asynchronous, uh, efficient kind of way, but just know that it's not going to be using the zero copy functionality. All right, thanks. For, oh, um, yes, one more. You can absolutely use Rx Java with Rat Pack. Um, in fact, we don't have Rx2. We do have uh, a branch that I think is pretty much ready to pull into the main code. But um, yes, you can use it. You can use Rx Java with, um, with Rat Pack. We do have a module for that. All right, thanks for your time. <laughs>